So uh, just to remind you, Noah asked us to speak uh, about uh, guiding and evaluating. I'll touch on even some of the same related topics of memorialization later on in the talk, but let's just get right into it with a couple of uh, examples. Possibly <laughs> cautionary. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, this uh, beautiful painting uh, here uh, uh, has been f uh, featured in uh, Art Forum magazine, the Alternative Museum in New York, by uh, artists uh, Vitali Komar and Alex Melamed. Some of you may, uh, may know it. It was actually produced with the support of the uh, uh, Nat National Institute hired by uh, uh, Martilla and Kylie to conduct a series of polls. So in 1994, they began a process supported by the Chase Manhattan Bank. Uh, as a poll of, and, uh, of 1,001 adult Americans were, uh, were residing in the 48 contiguous states, interviewed by telephone by trained professionals. So the typical interview took 24 minutes to complete. Respondents were selected from all of these uh, uh, households that, using a random procedure. Gender quota, quotas were observed, uh, et cetera. And so we found, they, they found things such as uh, that people prefer uh, outdoor uh, scenes to indoor scenes and certain types of animals and paintings. They like mountains, uh, right? Uh, so keep that in your mind as kind of one example of uh, evaluation methods. Uh, <laughs> So, so while you hold that uh, in, in your mind, let me share with you a, a quotation, and I ask you to imagine this appearing in an engineering journal called a Vibrational Dynamics. So the article describes the work of an engineer and reads as follows. The revelation that the really real is what he called vib vibrating sensations. They are paradoxically real, always in motion. They are ne never securely given. This is all more true because these sensations exist relative to one another. Uh, he did not himself realize that there was a method to the madness of their vibration, although he suspected there was one. He analyzed his sensations in search of it, but he never found it. Perhaps because he became more interested in strange perceptual uh, fact, uh, it was only through their relationship to one another that they became substantial. Whenever he searched for the one true sensation, he found himself absorbed and sometimes lost in the labyrinthine relations of the matrix of sensations. So again, this is uh, in an engineering journal. Well, actually, no, that was uh, Donald Cuspit describing the work of uh, Paul Cezanne. So, uh, so, uh, so th 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 these examples are worst cases in a particular kind of sense. And it's in the sense that if we were to display the painting as an it's displayable as an interesting conceptual artwork, right? But as an earnest example of artistic excellence in contemporary painting, obviously, it's not going to be shown in the same uh, uh, museums. And clearly, the, the Cezanne uh, quotation wouldn't actually be published in an engineering uh, journal, <laughs> right? And part, part of the reason is because the values used in development or evaluation don't match the context, uh, right? So these were tongue-in-cheek examples, yet one of the issues is that these, uh, these kind of phenomena often happen in earnest. And we've all seen examples uh, of this at it's, uh, numerous uh, conferences. Say, for example, uh, uh, a certain strand of artists presenting at an engineering co uh, conference. And it's not the, just the person presenting the work. It's the dialogue and the interaction between the different communities intersecting. So uh, say, presenting a work and being asked about generalizability and evaluation questions. And they say, oh, well, that's, that's actually interesting. I haven't cons considered that. Right? And so, or say, in an in arts conference. And, a com and of course, this is a parody right, right, of sort of two extremes. But a computer scientist saying, you know, I'm an outsider, so I'm here to, to really learn from you. I'm used to uh, kind of rig rigorous objective methods myself, but you know, I have a project that's a fun project I wanted to present here. Right, so, uh, right, so, uh, right, so maybe you'll have to suggest that, that this actually happens sometimes. So, right. And so what I want to focus on first are just a couple of issues. There's a lot to think about relating to, uh, uh, to evaluation. So besides just quantitative versus qualitative, of course, and a couple of issues I think are interesting to explore, I'll talk about, and then present a few pro projects and talk about the kind of ways in which I guided and evaluated these projects. So the first is a kind of cultural critique. Noah asked me to talk some about uh, close reading, which I won't do much of. I think in some ways is akin to, to a kind of critique practice in the arts and a kind of evaluation methods in uh, uh, technology research. And on the other hand, is this issue of creating culture or cult culture building, inventing things that, say, the society ne hasn't necessarily 
uh, de demanded if we want to take a, a, a kind of social, social determinist uh, uh, perspective or serving uh, uh, needs, say, eliciting the needs of users and trying to serve th those uh, needs. And so let's just start with a uh, uh, example. This is uh, uh, Meehan's well-known uh, tailspin, right? Henry the squirrel was thirsty. He walked over to the river bank uh, where his good friend Bill Bird was sitting. He slipped and fell in the river. Gravity drowned. So, right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's somewhat well-known. Uh, Ian Horst will mention a few other kind of interesting examples that came out of a uh, tailspin on the bus last night. So, but actually the interesting thing here is that the logic behind this non sequitur is impeccable. So gravity is pulling Henry into the river. It has no friends, arms, or legs that can save it from the river. Therefore, gravity drowns. Uh, but uh, there's actually, uh, we could say, a startling type check error that has uh, uh, occurred here. So this is just to suggest that we can look at, uh, let's say, issues like the exhaustiveness of, of the planning uh, uh, algorithm, yeah, efficiency, which is maybe kind of beat on uh, too, uh, too much, or even test human subjects for things such as, uh, uh, so, so a number of, say, interactive narrative producers look at things like interestingness, so right, and try to uh, come up with some uh, objective way to, to test for it. In some, on some hand, uh, on the other hand, some subsequent systems do better in terms of creating maybe co some somewhat coherent uh, uh, narratives. And of course, this is a kind of outlier uh, uh, case that, that I selected just because of its interest. Uh, and we could say that when we compare this to other AI systems, we're actually doing what in the humanities people think of as an intertextual reading. So it just means that you're comparing one system's output to another system's output. Uh, we might also look at it in close reading, which is what Noah asked me to, to, to speak about some, and, and to try to understand so what this is conveying, how it relates to kind of other cultural themes, you know, et cetera. But we might also look at it, say, another kind of middle of the road approach might be from cognitive science, so people like George Lakoff, Mark Turner, and others who look for, say, families of metaphor. And, and uh, you might say, is this a kind of trite metaphor that's been used before? Is this a well-known metaphor? Is it based on an embodied image schema, motor sensory experience? Uh, so there are a number of ways to, 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 look, to look at and evaluate this kind of work. Let me give you another example. I'll ask you to speculate again for a moment that it was created by uh, a computer. So how would we evaluate the success of this uh, poem? Right? Is the fact that this uh, green knife pops up here as it runs through the street, is that a bug uh, of the poem? Is it a type check error? I mean, it's, it's not exactly sensical to terrorize a law clerk with a cut lily uh, either. Right? But this is actually a poem by Pablo Neruda, kind of an acclaimed uh, uh, poem. And so uh, how would we really try to understand what the, uh, uh, or evaluate this, this kind of poem through interpretive engagement with, with other works? Uh, well, again, we could look at it from another different uh, 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 factors. In some of our, our own work, we also looked at the cognitive science approach, which is to say that there are sometimes metaphors that are generated by optimality principles. So this is from uh, uh, conceptual blending theory and cognitive semantics. But then you might also have some disoptimality principles for some of these kind of startling uh, experiences, like, like the green knife that pops up. And so uh, related to the discussion yesterday, is there some way to operationalize how you get some of these kind of seemingly non sequiturs? So that's a kind of open question. And it's a very subjective uh, a question of personal interpretation. Is there some way to bridge between these kind of evaluation uh, methods of cultural critique and evaluation? I think it's necessary for doing work uh, like, like this if you want to, say, generate it using a computer or engage or analyze it using a computer. So uh, secondly, uh, I want to raise this issue of what I'm calling here creating culture versus serving cultural needs. So uh, in engineering, of course, the, you know, one approach is, say, requirements engineering, trying to assess the needs of users of, of a project. Uh, we have evaluation of HCI systems looking for uh, desired objectives. Uh, social impact statements, Mark Ackerman has suggested in uh, CSCW, Computer Supported Cooperative Work, uh, to look at broader social impact. So using methods ranging from questionnaires, surveys, interviews, protocol analysis, sometimes even ethnomethodology from sociology. And so we could imagine for a second that, uh, say, this is just uh, from Facebook's page. This is describing the structure of a page. And why do you start with a snapshot, then share your experiences, then move on to common interests? You could imagine two pressures, one being kind of user studies to say, what do people want to share? Of course, also commercial pressures uh, as well. But another way to do this is to think kind of what would people need? You know, how would you want to change the way that people uh, interact with another? And so just for contrast, here's, here's another uh, site uh, called uh, Gender Fork. 
And on gender fork, actually, what you can do is define uh, kind of what you want to be called, how you want to be identified. They give a few suggestions. So it doesn't have the technological infrastructure, right? But it's a, it's a system for representing yourself it, and, and especially suited for subaltern kind of gender identifications, right? right? And so actually what I want to do in some way is challenge this dichotomy I have between creating culture and serving needs, because it's not clear which system is, uh, is doing what in some, in some way. Is this serving an un, uh, underrepresented need, or is it creating a kind of new culture? What would happen if Facebook were to adopt the, these norms, and, or, and how, uh, what, what kind of uh, say, rebellion uh, what would take place? And actually, I've had a student who worked on these kind of topics, and who was the one who brought this to my attention and created such a site. And actually, her site was much more like Facebook because of the necessary advertising revenue to run the site. She thought she would alienate some of the, uh, the clientele, which maybe is a, a cop out for a, this particular activist. But those are the kind of pressures she was trying to uh, negotiate. Anyhow, what I think is interesting here is to articulate the values that are embedded in, in either system, how they're instantiated in, in the particular infrastructures, how the infrastructures allow for, uh, say, either creating a kind of new form of self-expression through profile or serving particular needs, and what are the intersections uh, uh, between those. Of course, other issues like serving general versus specific audiences. and so. Anyway, these are the kind of issues that I'm interested in uh, grappling with. So how do you, because you're interested in topics like empowerment, you want to say build you know, culture. Sometimes it's not only to serve kind of existing needs that might build in them some pre-existing inequities, right? So it's a kind of challenge. So I'll talk about a couple of different uh, uh, projects that, that, I've, that I've done and explain some of the, the ch challenges that I've had with this uh, and, and some of the processes we, we've used so Nick mentioned my uh, GRIO platform for building interactive narratives, and then most, more recently, uh, Advanced Identity Representation Project, which is an NSF-supported project. I won't, go much, I won't go into the detail of the GRIO system, but just suffice to, to say that we've separated out a kind of semantics layer to think about how ideas are combined, say the conceptual metadata behind videos, blend those together, and then compose different videos, or generate text uh, uh, as well. And then we have a separate client level which, which presents this. And one project that we built using the, this uh, AI system was the Living Liberia Fabric Project. So this project was uh, in relationship with Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Liberia. Right? The most famous Truth and Reconciliation Commission was the one in South Africa, uh, of course. But Liberia was in some way modeled on that uh, process. Uh, just for, for a bit of background, right? the, the country of Liberia was never formally co colonized. Right? So it was established in 1847 by a group of freeborn African Americans, but actually repatriated by the American Colonization Society. So although it was never formally colonized, it was a, a, a it's like after, kind of post-slavery, this group of African Americans were sent there, who essentially became the elite group within Liberia. And so that set in motion a kind of hierarchical uh, system of exclusion and, and privilege within the country that's led to, uh, this, the short version, to several civil wars. Uh, the most recent civil war uh, ended in 2003, and so one of the suggestions was to memorialize the civil war. So I, have a, I had a colleague at Georgia Tech who works in this uh, area had a bunch of videos and an archive, but didn't do any kind of really digital media artwork. And I thought it was a worthy project. And I thought, OK, I'll lead my students for a year to see what kind of interesting interactive narrative we can come up with uh, with this uh, content. So it was challenging, because my students weren't inter international uh, 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 affairs uh, students. And so we spent about half of the year just talking to people. So the process, and so this is focusing on the guiding uh, aspect of, uh, of Noah's question. So first we did historical background uh, research. We did a review of peace, uh, peace museums. We looked at, the, there's actually a theory of peace museums and, and conflict uh, st studies. Uh, we did tr some traditional user analyses, so semi-structured clinical interviews. So we have met with diaspora Liberians within, within the Atlanta area. Uh, Scenario-based design, like some people have mentioned here. We did needs assessment, stakeholder analysis, requirements assessment. So we did, went through some of these kind of standard uh, steps in, in HCI, iterative prototyping. 
At the same time, there was this other level to deal with, which was that the students were completely daunted by, by the project. They thought, we have no authority with which to create a project about this harrowing uh, subject matter. I mean, myself uh, as, as well. You know, we had experiences. I, we had a Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner come in, a Peace Museum expert. We had a gentleman whose own son was tragically abducted to become a tra child soldier. And so in the HCI class, you don't have experience with, say, having somebody presenting this uh, harrowing information and trying to distill it in, in this kind of interpersonal context into something that, uh, say, is operationalizable, right? So, uh, right, so, so that's needless to say was a daunting process. The way we finally entered the project was through what I call a cultural computing, which was what are some of the values and aesthetic models and mourning models and memorialization models inherent within Liberian culture? And so, and how can we take those models and create our interface not using, say, a conventional uh, interface metaphor, although, of course, using the affordances of this machine, you'll see some that, that, are, that are well known. But then, to the best of our ability, how do we create something that's grounded in Liberian, Liberian culture? So we did uh, an assessment of memorialization and mourning there. So typical things like leaving flowers, so those aren't things that people do. Uh, in, the, the typical things, say, in this context, it's not what people do there. They come together to uh, a mat in the middle of the community. And so the idea of this fabric came out of this idea of, of this mat. We looked at the TRC final re report to see what are the crucial stakeholders with, within that context. Again, we met with people. And you know, again, and one of the kind of things you don't learn in, in the HCI class is that Although we, we, we conduct, conducted these semi-structured interviews, you know, afterwards people caught us to the side and said, you know, although in, in this discussion we were quite open, actually those people there are the people who poisoned the salt of these people here. And so actually we don't listen to what this person said and listen to what I say because they're actually the root of the atrocity. But there are 14 different ethno-linguistic groups in Liberia. And so unlike pointing to apartheid, there's no way to tease out the cause of, of, of blame here. So all these tangled kind of human uh, issues. So I had a couple of groups. One in the groups uh, looked at traditional forms of memorialization and stakeholder groups. The other group looked at the TRC's final report because we didn't just want to be a, a, a kind of mouthpiece for the TRC. We wanted to critically engage their perspectives as, uh, as well. So long story short, finally, we took all of that knowledge and then thought about, OK, what are the, cru the crucial themes that have emerged? What are the crucial stakeholder groups? And it's a kind of it's a reduction. I mean, it's like. Uh, uh, what, uh, Mary Lou presented the model of creativity. You have to create some kind of some kind of model that you can use to uh, to then uh, to implement. In this case, that model though came out of this process of, this, of talking to people and the kind of lo the long process that we talked about. So it's a kind of culturally situated model. So we ended up with uh, metadata. So <laughs> the me metadata annotates a series of assets we have: video collected in the f in the, in the field. Uh, uh, footage I licensed from documentary filmmakers, archival footage. We have a few different levels, so a level of visual uh, uh, information, a level of structural information, and the kind of conceptual information like prominent themes, activism, empowerment, and, and stakeholder groups. That was then uh, mapped into the LISP format that uh, the GRIO system uh, uh, uses. And then we have an analogy uh, finding engine that will find analogous metadata to help us choose subsequent clips to keep a coherence throughout the video. So anyway, I'll, I'll show just briefly a little bit of what this uh, looks like. So initially, we have, uh, we'll have images representing the different stakeholder groups. So the text is uh, generative. And then the, the uh, just to, to explain it, we'll have patterns that have different assets, potential assets within them that are related to the stakeholder group that's clicked. After we have the different patterns, we can select one image from within it. And then by analogy, we find the next best set of clips that will match the previous one. So we have variability, but we also try to ensure coherence throughout the, the narrative and then customize the text according to those choices. The testers at the various hospitals and clinics, because in Liberia, at the early stage, you will never know that you are a leper or you are a TB patient. But once you go at a hospital, while do your polio test, yes. you do your AIDS test, yes. you do your TB test, mm -hmm. and you do your uh, uh, leprosy test. test, it will prevent the various diseases from killing our people.
Earlier, I talked about being angry. That first part of my life was angry with the perpetrators, which meant these ex-child soldiers. When I started working with them, I realized that these young people are as much victim as I am. I want to send a greeting up to TRC and in the seventh grade class I want for TRC to help me with my education. So there's a narrative arc that that's uh, that uh, these clips occur around, and also I want to ap apologize just for the context of presenting, because I mean it's a work that's meant to be presented as a kind of memorial project, not just a tech demo for evaluation, right? So, uh, so that's just to provide a bit of a, a contextualization. Just to fast forward it, there is a kind of there is a narrative arc to it. It moves towards more future-related, uh, education-related, children-related initiatives in the future that came out of the kind of Peace Museum uh, studies aspect of, of, of the work. Then I say, my soul, my savior God, to thee, I pray that I, I pray that I. There was a theme you know, that we kind of selected you know, the children that went throughout, but I included, for, like Ken mentioned the other day, also the challenge with the system, right? So, we, I mean, so again, like a tailspin in a way, unfortunately, and it's painful to, to put it, but when I said the positive story of survival, there at the same time she's talking about the, this, this tale, right? And, but the issue is like, thematically it's coherent. She's talking about uh, children uh, there, and so it picked up on those particular themes, but at the same time, right, there, there, so the issue is, is, I mean, we can refine some of that, that's human judgment, say going back, you know, adjusting some of the text generation, but I just wanted to show the kind of challenge that's involved when you start to kind of combine the, these two different areas, and I mean, that's, doesn't actually happen that much, but I wanted to include this kind of example to show just kind of like what some of the challenges uh, are with, with this kind of work. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, uh, I'm just, just about out of time, so maybe I'll just very briefly uh, mention uh, a second project. This is the Advanced Identity Representation Project. That's a new, new, tool, uh, new models, uh, uh, toolkit and applications built on top of that to look at user representations across platforms and thinking about issues from a technical perspective that often come up in humanities, changing your self-representation for different groups, how stereotyping or passing and similar issues exist in digital media, uh, swapping between multiple identities, et cetera. And we can do things, for example, seed the system, so this is an, a generated category, we seeded it with a few different games and found kind of not groups people have signed, in, signed up for, but groups that have emerged uh, implicitly. So using point-wise mutual information, that's, that's a way we can look for likelihood of co-occurring likes that people, people have. And so we find interesting information like that this is gamers. We selected a few different games like Minecraft, Civilization, and found when this person's network is hundreds of people, these gamers also tended to like a certain number of classical music composers. Right? So it's discovering information about these groups that we didn't necessarily, uh, that we didn't necessarily know, doing things then like comparing ourselves to these groups. This is a student comparing himself to the group he found, which are hipsters, and finding, OK, he doesn't actually overlap that much with the <laughs> hipsters in, a, in his group. So you could say it's a tool for, for passing. And so just to, uh, <laughs> no, so really, without the abbreviation, say really engage the, these kind of issues at a technical level. So we look at, so it's, again, operationalizing some of these kind of issues. And, and what we've had to do, just I want to get, just get to the point, which is the uh, evaluation, which is, uh, we had to try to understand, say, does this actually represent something like people? Is this some way that you can imagine what an identity looks like, what a group looks like? And so we had to do some evaluation work, and similarly with other, other systems, like a game to create, a, uh, to try to understand phenomena of dis discrimination when we, and if, if I just end with, with, with this uh, game, 
Right, so there's this phenomenon of very subtle discrimination. We modeled with these kind of sea creatures. It's this kind of discrimination, say, like, saying to, uh, uh, micro, it's called microaggression, say, saying to an Asian American person, like, you speak English so well, can you help me with this math problem? Right, kind of covert uh, racism, right? So, or assumption of criminal status is another one, ascription of intelligence, right? So we actually model it with these uh, 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 creatures. <laughs> and then we try to understand, do people un understand this? Uh, who was aggressive? What was the scenario you just mentioned? We use that information to structure the narrative. We also use information about whether they're passing or not. We create the character based on their Facebook profile. We have a series of different uh, microaggressions. And then finally afterwards, we, pre so th we present the same scenario again. The, the different outcomes change depending on all of these different factors. There are different clinical ways people tend to respond to microaggression. We want people to better understand those different ways. And then finally, uh, we, have, we show the same scenario again. Do people change the way that they saw it? We have a number of kind of tradition. Is it too didactic? Is it too evocative? You know, so we're trying to really understand how it works. And there's a place where kind of radical pedagogy comes together with, uh, uh, in some way with the kind of learning science's aim of creating conceptual changes. So there's a natural match between the artistic aims and the kind of research aims. And in that sen sense, the kind of some traditional metrics actually made sense in a way that, say, some artists might resist for certain other kind of works. And so that's the nutshell version. Uh, all beyond this, we can seek. Uh, so that's, this is what we did <laughs> here, matching methods to values. Uh, we can also look for new methods to guide and evaluate the systems for hybrid goals. And so that's something we do in, in other projects. If you're interested in the project, we have an iOS version and a Flash version. So we can show, share some of the, the work in more depth uh, later. Thank you.